Rodent is an intriguing Pokemon in a Crystal Solo Challenge. Route 1 Rodents, they're historically pretty good. They have a lot of options. And I guess the best comparison that I can give you with runs that I've already done would be Kangaskhan, except when you look deeper into Furret, you'll notice that it has lower HP, lower attack, lower defense, lower special defense. And Furret even has a similarly low base 45 special attack. And I know it sounds like, you know, I'm doing these comparisons and I'm dogging on Furret a little bit, but do not let these average stats fool you. The level upset isn't too interesting either, but a lot of Pokemon start off with things like Tackle or, in Kangaskhan's case, Comet Punch. So I think having 240 base power moves with 100% accuracy is pretty good on its own. Defense Curl can come in handy. And then later down the line, Amnesia is going to be pretty great. We don't need to talk about that now. And then we can flip over. Furret learns everything. If you look at this little teeny tiny text TM list here, Furret learns just about everything. So just grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's just get to the start of the game. And I think this is going to be a very simple straight line path. There's going to be no extra battles. And before you know it, it's already time to jump straight into Faulkner. This is the first of maybe two battles where Defense Curl, it minimizes any risk and it lets you comfortably get rid of any extra training in the early game. I set up two and that's going to make us tanky enough and me and Faulkner's birds, we just kind of beat each other up until I win with just 12 HP and just like that, the first badge already down. Before I progress any further, I want you guys to keep in mind that all of my decisions from here on out, it's going to revolve around Chuck. And with that in mind, an early pink bow will even out eventually to save me some time in the long run. I'm also going to learn Mud Slap. It doesn't really have a ton of uses. I'm only going to use it very few times in the run, but Furret doesn't have any coverage until you get to Goldenrod, so it's just something you have to do. The only things to go over before the second gym is I get access to Swift. I do get Headbutt really soon after this, but I just have to have this extra damage now to smooth things over. I'd also like to talk about the final Slowpoke Well Rocket Grunt with the coffee. Now, I've been really pushing crystal runs as far as I can, and when you get to this point without any extra battles, this thing is a menace. There have been lots of occasions spread across many different runs where maybe I get a little bit greedy, I don't want to use a potion, or maybe I think I can just slip by where I'll just get poisoned and just outpace since coughing has high defense. Now, I err on the side of caution here. I open up with a few mud slaps just to stack up the accuracy debuffs, but this trainer has ended some runs and I want to give a little spotlight. And the last thing to mention here is I'm going to pick up the first optional battle of the game. That's going to be Bug Catcher Benny. And now we can finally look at Bugsy. This is where I'm going to use Defense Curl the most. I'm going to use it six times on a weak Pokemon like Metapod, and it's going to put me in a position to where I'm just, I guess I'll just say I'm rock solid. It's going to be to the point to where Fury Cutter will barely scratch me, and it's going to give me enough time to outpace. Now, I picked up Benny before this so that I could hit level 15 going into Scyther, because I found that even with plus six on your defense, you were just missing way too much damage at level 14, and you could easily still lose. But that's basically the long and short of it. We can hop straight into rival number two. This is why you need Mud Slap. You just can't deal with Ghastly without it. I guess you could learn Fury Cutter like I did here and use it about 46 times, but I'm good on that. And speaking of Fury Cutter, while the rest of this battle kind of plays out here, I've actually seen, tell me down below if you've seen this, I've seen a lot of channels hate on Fury Cutter a lot. I think I've seen somebody specifically say, hey, this move's trash. But I love this move. I think it's really good if you're trying to minimalize the crystal challenges, and we're going to see it in action soon. And Alex, I do get headbutt, no point in looking at it, that's cool. But a larger evolution of sort of like streamlining crystal is that I no longer get the haircuts. There's a pretty rare one in five chance to get a plus 10 friendship, and that's gonna be the only worthwhile outcome. And even then, even if you get plus 10, it doesn't really change the run much. It's similar to the vitamin buy in gen one where I just cut it out in most good runs these days, because it feels like one of those things where you're just doing it because it's there, but in my opinion, it is, it is a waste of time. The next option battle I'm going to be picking up is Fire Breather Walt and his two Magmars. And outside of my first times three new metric run, the video I did with Fortress, I finally, I'm eventually going to get to show off rollout. We're going to go get it. Now I was really wrong about the mechanics in that video and I understand it a lot better these days. But for now, just remember that we pick it up. I'll go over it later. And when we get inside of Whitney's gym, there's going to be another optional battle. I'm going to fight Last Bridget. She has three Jigglypuffs and if you can one shot them like Furret can here, it's a very lucrative battle. 
battle, but this is the third optional battle of the run if you're keeping track. And I think it's worth noting because the current top run that I've done is for Alligator and it only did two optional battles for the entire game. When it comes to the gym, this is the main reason I, I really like Fury Cutter. Now if you don't over level, Mil Tank is a menace, whether it be rollout damage stacking up or it going straight stomp for massive damage, and then if you start to get it low, it can just use Milk Drink, stall you out, and Fury Cutter just means that if you take just a little extra time on Clefairy, by the time you make it to the cow, Fury Cutter will have like a massive 180 effective power, and you can do like 95% of its health in one hit, and you can just end the battle very quickly. The plain badge and its normal damage boost, it's great, but let me quickly touch on the elemental punches just before I forget and no one's out there left wondering. It's kind of the same as Kangaskhan, where outside of some rare exceptions, special moves will never out damage normal moves due to that 45 base special attack. Now I'd say that I did about 5 furret runs, and the first 3 I was actually picking up all 3 punches from the department store at various points in the game, but the optimizations and kind of cleanup, it led me just to skip them all together. On the way to Ecritique, I'm going to head through National Park and we're going to be picking up Dig. Now, I'll be the first person to say it. I've said it a lot. Gen 2 Dig, not really that good. It's actually barely better than Mud Slap since it only has 60 base power spread over two turns. But ground coverage, it's so pivotal to the run and just having something a little bit stronger than Mud Slap, it's good enough at the end of the day. After the Kimono Girls, we get to see the diversity of Furret's learn set come into play. I'm going to teach it Surf. And right here, we have a core that's going to stick with us to the vast majority of the game. We have a strong normal move, we have surf coverage, we have dig coverage, and those three moves are going to basically cover anything that the game can throw at us. Looking at rival number two, this is the part of the game where I think it starts to get a little dicey and I took the most risk. The earlier battles means that I am level 23 here, and that does give me a an okay 9% chance just to one-shot Haunter, but more often than not, you're just gonna get cursed and you're gonna have to deal with that for the rest of the fight. With Magneton, Dig is the only thing that can one-shot it, but since it's a two-turn move, I will take some curse damage, and this is where the fight starts to get a little risky. I can one-shot the Zubat, and at the end, there are some things that you would like to go your way to win. The first is that you can get a flinch. On any of the turns, get a flinch and you'll be fine. The second is that leveling up to 24 here gives you a slightly less than a coin flip to two shot the Croconaw and you can just be done with the fight. And finally, maybe the AI can just go for some bad moves and I can win that way. Here I get the flinch and you can see why it's so important because I live on just 11 HP and this battle was rough. It required a lot of planning to do immediately without losing any time. The fourth gym is next, and Dig is good enough to one-shot three of Morty's four Pokemon. Gengar is the only point of contention here, because if it hits Hypnosis and starts railing off Dream Eaters, there's really nothing you can do about it, and I find that if you just dig underground and it misses Hypnosis on the first turn, it just feels like there's more of a chance for it to do something like Mean Look on turn two. Now that's not true at all, and it's completely anecdotal, but it felt that way. But this one, not too bad overall. That's, that's pretty much your only lose condition. After that, it's time to head east, and before I reach Mahogany, I'm going to pick up another optional battle, Hacker Benjamin. Up at the Lake of Rage, I will get the candy, and something I would like to talk about is hidden power, just to give you some, toss out some thoughts here. I'm not going to use it this run. I have perfect DVs, but hidden power ground was something I thought a lot about. What it ultimately came down to was that there are roughly nine times from this point to the end of the game where I'm forced to use dig, and the question is, with the time it takes to go down the right path, cut some trees, go in the house, learn hidden power, and then backtrack. Is that faster than saving nine turns overall in the battle? And at the end of the day, the act of getting hidden power just took more time than the turn saves offered. I'd also like to talk about a new optimization here, and it's catching the shiny Gyarados. Just straight up, just catch it. And I want to go in depth a little bit here. At worst, this is just a straight up faster upgrade than getting Dratini later. Now, in the case of Furret, this Gyarados outlevels me, and it can actually beat me pretty regularly, so it can force several re resets at a pretty high rate. I can't outpace it and my solution in the first few runs was just to go get Thunder Punch. But obviously spending that much time and resources just for a single wild 
Pokemon felt a little bit silly, and this was the solution. Now, I need to do more testing here, but I do know what I did learn is that in Gen 2, you cannot run away from a shiny Pokemon if it outlevels you, but the TLDR here overall is that Gyarados is a faster alternative to Dratini. Next up is that section of the game where you talk to birds to get passwords and thanks to the magic of video editing, we can just get straight into that next gym. We often talk about Price being the weak link of the gym leaders in Johto, but when you do this route, you're a little bit under leveled, things can be a little bit tricky. Now I'm actually going to be utilizing Fury Cutter for the last time, just to sort of ramp up that damage and make things a little bit more manageable. Now if you take any chip damage in the fight going the headbutt route, Blizzard just becomes really deadly at the end, and just like Whitney, this one feels like the safer approach. With all that taken care of, it's time to head west, and there's gonna be three more optional battles on our path to the Chuckster. First up, we have the very efficient Bird Keeper Toby, and when we get inside the lighthouse, I'm gonna take on the first optional battle, it's Sailor Huey, and then the very last optional battle is gonna be Sailor Ernest. Now that'll segue us nicely into a brisk swim down to Cyanwood, and before you know it, it's time for Chuck Brother. This battle doesn't need an intro this week. I've spent so much investment into getting level 35, and when you have the pink bow, it does some really great things for us. First off, it trivializes Primeape, and more importantly on Polyrath, it gives us like an 80% chance to two-shot it. This means that Chuck, for the most part, gets one turn to do whatever he wants, and if I get put to sleep, so be it. I actually get both lucky and unlucky here. I don't get that 80% two-shot range, so the battle takes a little bit longer. It opens me up to more danger, but the luck part comes in because Chuck Chuck just kind of misses or wastes all his turns, and in my opinion, this was the hardest battle in the game. It needed the most preparation and attention to detail, but that's over with. Let's just kind of keep this momentum going. Now's the time you get fly, and I'm gonna pick up a couple of candies to pee pee up for later, and let's take this little lull in the action to take a look at the first split data for the run. You can see that the Faulkner split was pretty close, but from that point, you backtrack to get the pink bow, you pick up the optional battle in Bugsy's gym, and that's gonna set us behind early a little less than four minutes. And for every split since then, Furret is kind of maintaining that distance behind for Alligator, with the Chuck split being the highest so far at four minutes and 16 seconds. Remember that Feraligator is a pretty streamlined machine that only picked up one optional battle to this point, while Furret has already picked up a pretty massive seven extra battles, and the narrative that I would like to weave for this video is the story of the underdog and the fact that sometimes it's okay to go down time early. If you maybe see something in testing that a Pokemon can do that's unique to other runs, but we'll come back to split data a few more times in the video, but the story is that Furret had to do a little extra here and there, and it's just behind by a steady four minute pace right now. That's gonna take us into Jasmine, and this one is very straightforward and simple. Dig can one shot the Magnemites, and Surf is gonna be a clean two shot on Steelix. Now the only lose condition here is if you were to get crit, so that's why I don't even bother healing, but this one's clean, and what's not clean is that after the battle, it's time for that dreaded phone call. Team Rocket has taken over in Golden Run, and it's up to one single child to put a stop to them. But first, let's go over probably what's the first thing that Furret does a little bit different than other Pokemon. I'm gonna do my Golden Rod Mark by now, before the hideout. Usually you would wait till after, just because you can get more vitamins and it would be more efficient, but Furret with that 90 base speed, it simply just doesn't really need vitamins. Universally, I think in all good runs I've done that you would either want some sort of attacking vitamin to help with ranges, or maybe you'll need some Carbos to help you outspeed most of Red's Pokemon, but Furret will actually outspeed Red's Espeon, which is the fastest Pokemon in the game without the help. But since I'm here, I do pick up four proteins, and the main reason I came here early is so that I can go ahead and just pick up Return. Headbutt is pretty good, but I need that little extra punch to make the takeover section just be as fast as possible and I didn't want to double back and return here later for more vitamins but overall I would say that this section goes about as well as it can I don't have to heal once I have enough PP just to get through the whole part of the game and we can just jump straight into that final gym 
as a normal type, I have to formally welcome you guys to the return show, especially considering the 45 base special attack. I'm not really going to spend a long time in terms of like narration for a lot of the battles that are remaining in the game because what it's going to boil down to is that I use return, I use it a lot, and things die. With all the badges down, there's just a little bit more left to do before the league, and that includes getting both cave candies. It doesn't really take long, but inside of Mount Mortar, there is another prize that will help out later, and that's going to be the TM for Defense Curl. I will talk about this TM later in, in detail, but it doesn't really come into play until the end of the game. But outside of that, there's one last optional battle for the run. I'm going to pick up Cool Trainer Arena here. It's a very easy series of three one-shots, and it gives just the perfect amount of experience needed for the run and that's because at the end of the final rival fight I'm gonna hit level 48 now first and foremost level 48 is where we learn amnesia it's a very critical and crucial move for the success of the run but just like defense curl it's not gonna be important until red and for now it's just kind of just taking up a move slot the important thing here is that this is when I'm gonna burn all seven of those Johto rare candies that's gonna get me to level 55 and this is gonna put me in position to make the elite four be really fast and simple so let's kind to hop into those battles and see how they go. Let's not take too much of everybody's time up here, but Will is just a series of returns. Go figure. Slowbro can survive one, and that's pretty much the most excitement that you're gonna get out of this one, but it's a clean sweep. Koga is slightly more complex than Will, and by slightly more complex, I mean that I'll actually have to swap to a different move for Forages. Surf is not a guaranteed two-shot, but I do get the two-shot range here, which is, you know, pretty good, I guess. And this is one of those spots that I was swapping around the elemental punches, but I do think at the end of the day, just an extra extra mart visit just for a few Pokemon, it just wasn't worth it to me. But this one, return, clean sweep, you know how it goes. Now we get to Bruno, and this is another tough battle, probably the second toughest battle. Return does really nice here, but level 55 at the start of the league, it really helped a lot. Just like with something like Morty earlier, there is a lose condition that you can't do anything about, and it's Machamp cross chop. So let me just maybe toss out a few numbers for you. Our Furret right now has a flat 21% chance just to one shot the Machamp out right and in the battle. Cross Shop can also miss since it only has 80% accuracy and that's what's going to happen here. Now even if Cross Chop hits, you can survive even if you took some chip damage from Hitmonchan earlier, but Cross Chop is a high crit move. It means it has 25% chance to crit and it'll knock you out no matter what. Even if you have like an additional 20 levels, Cross Chop can max roll for like 300 plus damage on a crit. So it was something to think about. Now I guess what it all boils down to for me is that Machamp is a pretty scary Pokemon if you're a normal type. And that's about all there is to say. Karen is up next and sadly, Furret does not have the raw power to join that Umbreon one-shot club. Now it goes for Confuse Ray and I hit myself. And at this point, I started thinking, hey, Sand Attack's gonna come up next and this is gonna be a reset, but it just goes for faint attack and I snap out of confusion pretty early and eventually we'd move on pretty quick actually. Vileplume is a range, so something like Stun Spore can be an issue, but I actually get the one shot here. And let's talk about Gengar. Dig is just a little bit too weak to threaten a one shot, whereas if I went the hidden power route, I would have a much greater chance with the extra 10 base power. But it's worth noting that this is the only situation in the game that's like that. Now at worst, you would get cursed, but it really doesn't matter because return can just one shot the last two Pokemon now unless maybe you started to miss due to sand attack or maybe you got unlucky with paralysis this one isn't really that bad and swapping to hidden power wasn't really needed now before we get into that final champion battle I need to talk about something real quick I'm gonna learn rollout and in almost all of my other runs, I got rid of Surf before the league, and I was learning Defense Curl right here, but the best version of Furret needs to have Surf for a little bit longer. And I'll talk about that more soon, but I will be equipping a Paralyzed Cure Berry for safety, and let's just dive into it. So the strat here is rollout. Lance's whole team is weak to rock, and a plus two rollout can one-shot everything on his team. Now this battle is much more simple with defense curl since it makes rollout start at plus two, but I could not fit it into the learn set, so I have to make do without it. Now the only real strategy here is that paralyzed cure berry, just in case I miss, or maybe I make it to one of the Dragonites at only a plus one rollout and I can't one-shot it. It just makes it to where you don't have to worry about Thunder Wave. And this one goes pretty well up until the Charizard, but even my 
my rollout was reset here. And a plus one rollout, believe it or not, it cannot one shot a Charizard even though it's double super effective. So obviously after that it's gonna burn me. And what this translates to ultimately is that it opens me up to a little bit of extra damage since it halves my attack. The Dragonite lives an extra turn, but I do get the job done. And Furret is the champion of Johto. Now it's time for Kanto, and I do have a lot of things to say for that section, and I would also like to take a look at split data and kind of analyze that, but I don't want to try to fit it all in this little part of the game where I'm walking up to the Hall of Fame. So let's go ahead and just fade to black, and let's take a look at where Furret is truly a unique Pokemon. First things first, let me go over the single biggest time save. Now you're gonna see me here walk straight past the Pokemon fan club. It's where you get a rare candy and almost all Pokemon are gonna pick up the rare candy here, but Furret does not need them and I'm just gonna cut all of them out. There's three rare candies total in Kanto and you might not think that they take up a lot of time, but it really does add up through the little final bits of the game. And I would say that this is the main catalyst that contributes to what we're about to see. And real quick, let me go back to the split data for a second since we haven't looked since Chuck. Now Furret has not gained any time. In fact, I've actually lost time chasing that gold medal. And going into the Kanto section, we were four minutes and 37 seconds behind. And we'll come back to this soon. I just need you to know where we're at right now. And I just need you to know that the situation hasn't really improved that much. The second biggest thing was the adjustment of my learn set. Now I referenced it earlier, I was learning defense curl with rollout to make Lance really quick and easy, but the consequences of that was that you had to finish up the rest of the game with only rollout and return for damage, and holding on to surf, it really smoothed things out. There were a lot of places it helped, but I'm gonna go over the really big ones. Now Brock took what felt like four or five times longer with only resisted moves, and it goes without saying that surf is just a solution that sped things up dramatically. Next we got Blaine. Now the Macargo specifically went from being a menace, taking like four or five hits on its own, to just drowning to the double super effective damage, and the final really helpful spot was on Blue with his ride on. And I'm not gonna just tell you that surf, along with skipping the rare candies, took this run to the next level. I'm gonna show you. We're gonna take a look at the split data once again. And what was once a near five minute deficit that we just could not overcome no matter what, is now an actual nine second lead for it has made up all the time in the Kanto section. This little ferret, it kept its head down, it did the early training that it had to do, it stuck to the plan, and finally, basically at the very end of the game, a green split has emerged and Furret is actually ahead of her alligator. And let's talk about red preparation. Normally this is the time where you would get the final rare candy and you would use all your other candies to get to the level that you kind of deem fit for red, but like I've already said, for it does not need candies. I would also like to just point out that the final rare candy to the right of the Mount Silver Poke Center specifically cost a bunch of time, and even though Furret doesn't have to use any candies or go out of the way and pick any of them up, I do have to run one errand. From Mount Silver, I can fly to Blackthorn. I'm gonna finally use the move deleter to get rid of Surf, and from that point, it's time to do two things. I'm gonna learn Defense Curl, and I'm gonna equip Leftovers. That's all I need for Red, so I think we can just dive in and see if Burt can pull off a pretty big upset. I will say it always makes me happy when I can say that Pikachu is outsped in one shot and that we never have to look at it again for the video. So let's talk about the set here. At level 66, I outspeed Espeon, and the goal here is to set up three amnesias. Now this will let us be absurdly tanky to pretty much any attack Espeon uses, but do keep in mind that it will set up Reflect eventually, and I have to take that into consideration. I didn't touch on Rollout much earlier, and let me do that now. Rollout starts at 30 power, it lasts five turns, and on the overlay we can actually see the effective power increasing. It's actually 33 effective power right now due to Brock's badge, but you get what I'm saying. It's gonna double each turn, so it'll go 30, 60, so on and so forth, and normally it caps at 480 effective power. Where things start to get interesting is with Defense Curl, and here's how it correctly works. If I use Defense Curl at any point, just once, at any point during the fight, Rollout will now permanently start at plus two, meaning that it's gonna start at 60 base power. It can still stack to five 
times, and that means that the new total effective power, if you use just one defense curl at any point during the fight, will be 960 effective power, which will even one-shot the Snorlax with ease. Now, where I made mistakes a long time ago trying to explain this is that I thought that you had to use defense curl every single time that you started up a new rollout, but just one defense curl is all you need. Now, pretend, if you will, imagine that using defense curl puts a status on you called curled because that's how I keep track of it in the overlay and it just kind of sticks with you the whole battle. Now you might notice here that I'm not really talking about the battle. It's red, it's the hardest fight in the game. You figure I have more in-depth strategy but the whole the TLDR of all this is that with leftovers and boosting up your defensive stats, Burret can just become absurdly tanky and with a curled rollout stack, there's more than enough damage to just obliterate everything. It's really honestly surprising how consistent this battle is and how dominant fur it can be. And now we can kind of see why I didn't need any candies as we watch the final rollout smash through Blastoise's shell and fur it ends the run. Furret finishes the game with a final in-game time of 3 hours, 32 minutes, and 31 seconds, and we have a new champion at the top of the leaderboard. If you didn't watch the Feraligatr stream, it was a pretty risky route where it was still a struggle to get sub 333 game time. I still had some resets, and I still I wasn't sure it was going to be passed, but here we are. I also have a treat for you guys. I have tier cards made up, and I have a tier list. I only got 9 total Pokemon, but let's bring out the top 3. Let me just quickly talk about the formula for Crystal and how it differentiates from the gen 1 formula the main thing here is that the grading scale is much harsher and the scaling on the resets is harsher for crystal since I just do better at runs overall there's still the whole two free reset clause and there's no bonus for zero reset runs anymore but what that all adds up to is that for it is now basically the baseline 100 out of 100 run we'll adjust that in the future if we need to and you can see that for alligator with its you know 30 second difference and the resets uh, it's about half a point below that Lugia high 97 and then when you flip through to the next one you can just kind of look at them and see you can see where like the A tier would end where you start getting into the B tier it's Politoed. I would say around a 345 in game time would be about an 89 I'm not really too sure but you can see Politoed's rating and it was very important for me to be accurate with these ratings and Noctile and Fortress really helped with that uh, I was pretty adamant about Noctile being like a low C tier Pokemon like barely above the C tier so I kind of went around that and made sure all the numbers made sense and Fortress it's Fortress it might well be the worst crystal run I ever do because I don't really like doing runs that bad but 27 it's not good but that's the tier list tell me what you think down below and if you made it this far in the video you're a real one I've been working really hard on getting my outros to be quicker because I feel like they're too long but special shout out to my channel members and patreons and just real quick I would like to say I haven't said this officially in a video but you probably noticed that I went to like a one video every two two weeks kind of format and it's just because real life is picked up I uh, just remember as much as I would love for this to be my job and get paid like a sufficient amount for it to be my job it's not it's just a hobby and when all the other parts of life start to pick up unfortunately this is where I have to kind of cut back it was kind of stressing me out trying to keep up with an every week schedule so I did what's best for me and at the end of the day that's what you have to do so we're still trucking along we're not quitting but I just have to dial it back just a little bit and I guess that's about all I have for you guys and I will catch you on the next video. Bye.